You can start, Dr. Michio. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Spine Time. We're happy to be back this evening after a brief hiatus for the holidays. Um, my name is uh, Vincent Michio. I am one of the rehabilitation and interventional pain physicians at the Cornell Center for Comprehensive Spine Care, and uh, I will be your host tonight. Uh, tonight, we will be speaking about neuroradiology and the role that neuroradiologists play in diagnosing and treating uh, back pain. I am very excited to introduce our speakers uh, for tonight, uh, Dr. John Tesoris, uh, who is an associate professor of clinical radiology and who is the chief of uh, neuroradiology at Weill Cornell uh, Medicine and New York Presbyterian, as well as Dr. Gail Salama, um, assistant professor of clinical radiology. Uh, she is the director of spine imaging here at Cornell and at uh, New York Presbyterian. Uh, both specialize in imaging um, uh, of the spine and brain and uh, specialize in um, performing interventions for brain and spine conditions. Uh, they have a very interesting presentation for you tonight um, and they'll be happy to take your questions. Uh, please go ahead and type them into the chat box below and uh, we'll get to as many as we can. Please remember, we can't give you individual advice about your um, individual medical conditions. Um, so please try to keep the questions general. Um, and uh, certainly if you have any additional questions, um, we are definitely available to see you uh, in person uh, in the Spine Center um, and we can come on and come, you can come in and uh, have your questions addressed in person. Uh, as you know, the um, Weill Cornell Medicine Spine Center is a multidisciplinary uh, center for comprehensive care. So we offer neurology, pain management, rehabilitation medicine, uh, and neurosurgery for those who need it, all under one roof. Um, we work with many other departments in the hospital as well to deliver optimal care for our patients. Um, and certainly neuro, uh, neuroradiology is a huge part of uh, what we do. So um, uh, first, Dr. Salama is going to lead us through um, some aspects of neurology, uh, of neuroradiology. Um, and um, acquaint us a little bit with uh, different types of modalities that are used, uh, as well as going through some of the common interventions that neuroradiologists can offer. Dr. Michi, <laughs> thank you so much for the introduction. Um, Dr. Tesoris and I are happy to be here and speaking with you and having you know, a group of interested um, patients and colleagues listen to our chat and we're happy to answer questions as they arise. Um, and we look forward to um, a great conversation. Next slide. So I thought I'd begin by giving you an example of our um, outpatient imaging center waiting room. So um, patients get ordered for a imaging study by a physician that they've seen for some sort of condition, either a new one or a chronic one, and their provider decides at that time of their visit that they should have an imaging study. So I thought it would be a nice introduction to talk about sort of that patient experience and coming, coming for that imaging study, um, what they'll expect, and then what happens with those results and some of the interventions that might arise from the results of that study. So there are several people that are involved in your imaging when you come to an imaging center. We, the radiologist, the, the radiology physician works closely with a whole group of people. So we work with our technologists who are experts in image acquisition, um, how the machines run, how to run the, the sequences that we need to obtain, how to optimize the images along with our guidance. We really look, work closely with these individuals to get the best imaging possible for our patients. We also work closely with nurses who make sure our patients are safe and feeling well during their imaging encounters. They're often one of the first people you meet. They double check that um, you're in the right place and that you're getting the right study. Um, sometimes if you need a, an IV, an intravenous catheter for a contrast injection, or you need to have some sort of oral contrast that you take, so they'll work closely with you for those components of the examination. And they work closely with us to make sure our patients are feeling well um, 
during our examinations. And then after the imaging is actually acquired, that imaging goes off to what we call our PAC system, which is essentially our computer system that archives all of the images that our patients get. And we work closely with each other within radiology, as well as in an interdisciplinary approach to analyze those images and identify either the normal components or abnormal components that might be present on those scans. Um, next slide. So these are different imaging modalities. Modalities is just a term we use to describe types of imaging that patients can get. There's x-rays, which you see on the left. There are CT scanners, which you see in the middle. And there are MRI scanners, which you see on the right. So all of these machinery look different. It's a different patient experience um, in these things. And they produce different images. Um, and we can use these modalities together or independently to best assess the patient's anatomy and see if we can identify the symptom or concern that the patient is having if there's a correlate on the imaging. Next slide. So first I'll talk about radiographs, which is the fancy word that you, we use for x-ray. Um, and this is sort of what we consider the simplest evaluation, both in terms of the patient experience and the analysis of the x-ray. Um, it's a very easy experience for the patients. Um, they come, they put the area of interest under the x-ray machine and sort of the technologist will take those pictures. We use x-rays often in the setting of trauma. They're quick, so it doesn't take a very long time to acquire them. We can get answers quickly about if there's a major trauma. Um, we use them to assess for bone density and they're good screening exams for patients that are over the age of 70 but a radiograph isn't always the final answer. And we sort of consider it a screener to know whether or not sometimes more imaging of a higher level is required. So we use findings on x-rays to decide if we need more imaging. And we also use patient history and patient experience, right? So I think both the imaging and the ordering provider and the patient have to work together to decide if a radiograph or an x-ray is really enough to answer the question. And we have certain things that we call red flags, which are like basically saying, whoa, wait a second, maybe an x-ray is a good screener, but we can't stop here because it's not sufficient to tell us that nothing's going on. Um, so I put in red some examples. These aren't all of the red flags, but if a patient has a cancer history um, or a history of immunosuppression and they have signs that they may be infected and those, those symptoms that they're having are related to the spine, a spinal x-ray may not be your final destination. You may have to then go on for further imaging such as a CT and an MR. Radiographs are really good for certain things and one could argue that they're even better than a CT or an MR for certain things. So in the last note I noted here, um, they're really good for evaluation of alignment. Um, also, patients can do different maneuvers more easily next to an x-ray machine than they could if they were in a CT machine or an MRI scanner. So they can move in certain ways and we can capture that image with an x-ray a little bit easier than we can capture it with a CT or an MR. It's also really good for um, evaluation of hardware. A lot of our spine patients have hardware. They have lots of surgeries and we can evaluate how their hardware is doing on a radiograph. So, and also in our scoliosis patients, um, an x-ray is really good to sort of see how a patient appears in certain positions and really get a large field of view where the whole anatomy is within the image that we're looking in. Next slide. I think you make an, an interesting point there about how, you know, radiographs, although they're simple and, and we kind of think of them as simple, they can be quite helpful, um, you know, as an interventionalist, um, uh, you know, I do a lot of uh, interventions under fluoroscopy and fluoroscopy is basically like a portable x-ray. Um, and so when I look at um, a patient's images on um, the fluoroscope, when I'm doing my procedure, it looks a lot like the x-ray that they would have actually uh, as an outpatient. And so sometimes when I, when I look at that, um, that x-ray, it really informs uh, how I would approach an x-ray um, doing a procedure under uh, fluoroscopy. Um, um, and so it just goes to show that all of these different modalities have their, have their role, definitely. 
Yeah, definitely. And I think um, it's important to remember that as a, as a patient and even as the provider that more than one imaging study may be indicated or necessary. So not to get frustrated if you don't get your answer with just one evaluation. And if somebody comes back and says, hey, maybe this is the next step, that that may be part of the expected process. And, you know, it takes time and, and multiple modalities to get the best answer for our patients. And let me uh, address a question here on the chat. Um, one of the um, participants asked, why are x-rays recommended for patients over 70? Um, it's actually not just x-rays, it's, it's imaging, because as you get older, especially over 70, there's a larger or higher chance that you may actually have some pathology that's worth diagnosing. So if you have um, a history of osteoporosis or cancer, which is more common in the elderly or the old, older individuals, then and a back pain may not just be um, run-of-the-mill um, muscular um, or related to just facet disease. It may actually be something more suspicious or concerning. So we tend to image patients that are older um, much more, um, uh, well, quicker than we would someone who is 22 years old who strained his back picking up something, in which case it's not as concerning. Right. I, I agree, Dr. Tesoris. And, and there's a lot of data that sh shows that, it, you know, in younger patients, um, when patients complain of back pain or spinal issues, those patients tend to recover fully over time. So um, based on that evidence-based data, we may wait to image them, whereas that age cutoff has been shown to put you at higher risk for a significant pathology or abnormality, and maybe we shouldn't be waiting those six to eight weeks, and we should image it sooner. That's absolutely correct. Um, so moving on to CT, our, our second modality to discuss. C CT is very actually similar to x-ray in the sense that um, we use radiation to see different bone densities and different densities within our body. And the thing about CT is we get superior bony detail. So um, it's sort of the way we look at it is it makes different cuts through the body and we can see um, much more detailed than we can in an x-ray. Um, an x-ray, you could think of it more like you're seeing shadows through the, through the body, whereas a CT is you actually see that detailed anatomy of, of each component. Um, so it's wonderful for evaluating bony detail. What CT fails at is a lot of the soft tissue pathology or the soft tissue abnormalities that can be associated with spinal disease of all sorts. Um, so we don't evaluate the spinal cord at all on a CT. So when patients present with spine issues, sometimes it is that bony anatomy that's causing the problem, but sometimes it's some of the soft tissues or the spinal cord issues. So we also have to rec remember that CT isn't a complete evaluation of the whole sort of spinal column as well as the associated structures. Um, also, you can have things that are soft tissue abnormalities that may be very difficult to see on CT just on, because of the way CTs are acquired. Um, and they don't do such a good job at necessarily seeing the soft tissues related to the spine, whereas MR does a much better job um, for finding abnormalities related to the spine. CT is an amazing tool though, and there's lots of great things that we can do with CT when evaluating um, patients for spinal disease. Um, we can reformat these images. We can manipulate them to look at the spine in essentially indefinite planes. Um, now our software is such that we can turn your spine and cut your spine in um, innumerable ways when we're looking at these images. Um, and we can also make 3D reconstructions um, called volume rendering, where we actually see the 3D image as a whole, and we can manipulate that as well. Um, and this has become really useful in picking up abnormalities that may have been missed, you know, 10 to 15 years ago, um, which is really neat. So this is an example of all of these different planes. Well, uh, three planes are typical planes that we see. And then the volume rendering, which is on the left, which is sort of that 3D model on the computer of, of what the spine actually looks like. So this is a patient, a trauma patient that had two fractures of their vertebral bodies. You can see that towards the top of the patient. 
um, and we can assess the degree that that vertebral body flattened, which is the abnormality and the sort of crack or fracture through the vertebral body. And by using multiple planes, we can really see how that vertebral body got injured um, and, and what's the effect on the surrounding structure that it's having. Next slide. So that was an example of um, evaluating trauma on a CT. Um, a lot of times patient comes with back pain and it can be due to quote arthritis. We talk a lot about arthritis of the back and what does that actually mean? So th this is just an example of a patient on the left that has severe arthritis and on the right is sort of mild to moderate arthritis. And that's that joint that connects two vertebral bodies that are adjacent to one another. And this is an example of something can that can cause patients significant um, pain. And we see that because that's a bony abnormality, we see that extremely well by CT. Next Dr. Selma, when, when would a patient um, be a good candidate to have a CT scan instead of, let's say, an MRI? So there's, um, so there's several times where a CT is um, indicated. One, if on the radiograph you see a lot of arthritis um, and you need to understand a little bit in better detail where those bony protrusions are going and, and what impact that might have on some of the um, anatomy of the normal anatomy of the spine, a CT is going to show that osseous anatomy, that bony anatomy really well. And you actually won't see it that well on the MR. It's a little bit harder to pick up um, than it is on a CT. Sometimes patients have um, implants or medical devices that don't allow them to get an MRI. It's not safe for them. So we use CT in those situations. Um, and that gives us a good assessment of their osseous detail, their bony anatomy and their spine. Um, you know, and we have to take that with a grain of salt when we have those patients that we may not pick up everything, but at least we can do our best. And, and the CT might be best for that patient. Um, in the setting of trauma, we almost always use CT because it's much quicker to um, obtain those images than on an MR. An MR can take you know, anywhere from 15 minutes to 45 minutes, depending on what type of um, MR examination we're doing, whereas a CT is quick. Um, nowadays, it may take less than you know, two or three minutes to get all of those images. So trauma is a really important time where we use CT. We so have a question here in the chat. Um, sure. What implants and vascular stents are contraindicated to MRI scan? So we're, we're actually going to get to that in a second once Gail finishes, Dr. Salama finishes with the MRI section. But I can just quickly tell you that um, there are numerous medical devices and implants that are contraindicated uh, where you cannot get an MRI scan. Um, we have a, an entire list that's actually available to you online at mrisafety.com. Um, it's a compiled list that's constantly updated with uh, recent literature. So if you have an implant and you know the device number, you can actually go to mrisafety.com yourself and actually check that device. And in doing so, you have an idea of whether it's safe. A lot of devices today are conditional, which means that you can have an MRI scan as long as the MRI scan is done in the appropriate way. So like vagal nerve stimulators, for example, <clears throat> can be done, you can have an MRI scan if it's appropriately done with the correct parameters sent on the MRI scan. There are very few things that are absolute contraindications to MRI scans. For example, if you have shrapnel in your eye, that's an absolute contraindication. So, um, but those can all be checked. And I rest assured that our, our staff, when you come in and before you even come in, when you're when you answer your, the questions that we ask you when you're scheduling your MRI scan, we'll go through all of those devices and all those contraindications for an MRI scan. That way um, we, we can head it off at the pass to make sure that someone doesn't accidentally get an MRI scan when they shouldn't be. Oh, and as far as vascular stents, almost all vascular stents placed today are MRI safe. There are, we still check them, the product numbers, especially very old stents. But if you had a vascular stent within the past 10, 15 years, um, almost, almost they're all entirely safe. 
So Dr. Tesoris, I, I wanted to um, sort of touch upon something you mentioned, which is that most things now, there are very few things which are really contraindications where you absolutely can't get an MR. They're, they're very rare these days. And I think that's um, an interesting point to discuss because you know, 20 years ago, I don't think that was the case. I think you had a lot more um, providers and even radiologists who were concerned with a lot of the medical implants and devices that were put in. But over time, we've studied that we've studied these implants and maybe 20 years ago, someone would tell you, no, you, you can't get an MR with that. For example, pacers, pacemakers, right? Many years ago, almost everyone was like, no, you can't walk into an MRI scanner or near one with a pacemaker. And now between the advancement in the pacemakers itself, as well as our studies of patients that have gotten them under, you know, supervision, we know that many of them are totally safe to have with the appropriate, you know, medical provider, making sure that you're safe. But um, that's changed over time. Um, you know, people used to think surgical clips or orthopedic hardware weren't necessarily safe to go in. And we know now that most of those things are. So I think a radiologist we're experts in image interpretation, but we've also been trained to help you as the patient and the provider assess whether a patient is safe with their implants. So if there's ever any question, never hesitate to, whether it's at our, whether it's at our imaging center or somewhere else, never hesitate to call ahead of time and ask to speak to a radiologist or the chief technologist or someone there that can really assess whether or not, you know, you have a contraindication because maybe an MR is the best study for you. And, you know, it would be a shame for somebody to think they couldn't get one when they actually could. So really having that conversation, um, if there's any questions, may be really useful for patients. Yeah, the, uh, I second all of that. And I think that one of the main things that always comes up is pacemakers. And, and historically, patients with pacemakers were not able to get MRI scans, would always get CT scans. And that has changed significantly. Um, the manufacturers, the device manufacturers are now making MRI safe or MRI conditional pacemakers. Um, and we've actually have accrued data, including studies published in the New England Journal of Medicine, which show that you can even take a legacy pacemaker that is not MRI conditional and still scan them. Um, I just want to make very clear to everyone out there that you cannot have an MRI scan with a pacemaker at, at any place. It has to be typically a hospital with controlled environments, um, with um, electrophysiology, which is cardiology, that's there monitoring your pacemaker. So you can not schedule a, a pacemaker MRI scan at a private practice in the middle of nowhere. It has to usually be at a major academic center. And there are a few questions up here. I don't know, yeah, Vincent, thank you. you wanna- Thank you so much for this. Um, Ed, this is actually very, very helpful for me as a, as a physician, because I have lots of patients we have a lot of uh, different types of medical devices in them, and they always have these questions. So this is really quite helpful. Yeah. Um, yeah, and some, you know, some of these questions in the chat box here about hip or knee replacements um, are most of those um, uh, MRI conditional, as in, are they safe to have? Yes. So, so, so right. any 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 large hardware piece of hardware fusion, especially in uh, your spine fusion hardware or hip replacements, knee replacements are all MRI safe. Um, typically these are titanium or non-ferromagnetic, non-iron containing implants. So the only concern that we have with, um, hardware is whether it will degrade the image quality of the MRI scan. If we're imaging the part of the body where the hardware is located, but, um, we actually have new protocols now with MR that help reduce that, uh, um, the artifact from even spinal software, sp spinal hardware. So we can actually even see through the hardware and still make a diagnosis. But um, for knee, hip, um, a shoulder, et cetera, um, you're absolutely fine to have an MRI scan. Great. And, and spinal cord stimulators uh, these days are mainly MRI conditional as well, correct? Cor correct. And that, and that conditional means that, you know, providing that the MRI scan is done appropriately. And typically it's a lower field strength MRI, 1.5 um, Tesla and not 3 Tesla. And so and, yeah, that's an and, excellent. And, and, and pacemakers, by the way, became compatible probably about five to 10 years ago. Wow. Uh, before we go any further on with MRI, let's let um, Dr. Uh, Salama tell us a little bit more about it. And then I want to jump back to Dr. Tesoris a little bit to tell us about what makes for an optimal MRI and talk a little bit about those parameters. Sure. So, um, 
the other modality we talk about and use a lot in spinal imaging is MRI. And that really gives us a great assessment of many of the components of the spine that can cause patients discomfort, pain, or other issues. So um, common indications we talk about is radiculopathy or traveling pain in a certain distribution down a leg, down an arm. Um, cauda equina syndrome, where the nerve roots get compressed that are within the spinal canal. And there are certain symptoms um, that are red flag symptoms when patients present with that. And that's going to be very difficult to pick up on a CT and an MR will really assess whether or not those nerve roots are compressed to the degree of causing the syndrome. Um, neurogenic claudication. So that's a fancy term that we see associated when you're, you have significant spinal canal stenosis um, or really terrible narrowing of the spinal canal. And when we talk about um, complicated low back pain, so when you have red flag symptoms or um, you know a CT and radiograph just aren't giving you your answers and, and things are worsening and not getting better, and a uh, referrer thinks that you know further imaging is warranted. This is really the workhorse um, of of our of our group and of spinal imaging, and um, really really gives a great assessment of what's going on. And you know back in the day, CT and something called myelography, where you inject contrast within the spinal canal to assess. Um, inside of the spinal canal on a CT have largely become out of favor because MR, you know, doesn't have any radiation and is very superior in assessing the soft tissue structures of the spine, which is often a cause of the patient's condition. So just like we went through a few examples of what you can see on CT that's going to cause patient low back pain or discomfort, um, I tried to include a few examples of what we see on, on MRI that can account for patient's discomfort. So on the left, we have an example of a disc herniation. Um, the green arrow shows you what a normal disc looks like. Um, nothing poking out into that white area. The disc is the slightly light gray region between the two blocks. Um, and then on the right where there's an arrow, you can see that there's this protrusion or the disc material is sort of coming out into the spinal canal and, and causing some discomfort and probably giving the patient a radiculopathy or irritation of the nerve roots. And on the right, we have an example of what we call spinal canal stenosis or narrowing. The two top photos show you what a normal canal looks like, which is the white area. It's um, on the right image on the top, it's that circle. And we like to see a big circle with a bunch of white in it, and, and that's normal. And the bottom image shows that that white circle is now teeny tiny and it looks like a triangle um, and you lose all that normal white signal. And the white signal is just fluid that we normally see within the spinal canal and that's totally lost. So this patient was symptomatic because they had severe spinal canal stenosis at that level. And that's what spinal canal stenosis looks like on MR. Next slide. So this is an example of, um, you know, interesting pathology that's really important to pick up for a patient. Um, and this, this diagnosis would never be picked up on radiograph or CT. So it was super important for this patient to get an MRI. Um, it's hard to, it's, it's a little difficult to see, but where that red arrow is pointing to is little dots along the spinal cord there. And those little dots are reflective of abnormal vessels within the spinal canal that's causing a major problem in the spinal cord for this patient. And this can present in many ways, and there can be many mimics or other disease processes that somebody might think of without first thinking of a vessel problem within the spinal canal. And this is something that you can't see on a CT. It, you just can't, no matter how good of a radiologist you are and no matter how good the images are at the imaging center. So um, this is an example of the MR giving the answer for this patient. And then on the right is just a, an example of this patient went on to have a procedure where their vessels were directly injected with a dye or what we call contrast to show that this is an abnormal connection and, and this is the patient's problem. And then ultimately was treated. Actually, um, there's, uh, thank you, Gail. Um, before you go on to interventions, um, there's one more question that we didn't answer. I just wanna quickly touch upon. Um, someone asked, um, if someone had uh, non-traumatic multi-level compression fractures, would CT be the best way to image? So um, CT is very good, as Gail, uh, Dr. Salama mentioned, um, looking at the bony anatomy, the bones. And that 
CT scan with 3D reconstructions will give you a very nice understanding of what your anatomy looks like, whether there's any kyphosis or scoliosis or misalignment related to the compression fractures. However, if you're looking to see what was the underlying cause of the compression fractures, whether it's osteoporosis or cancer or infection, then MRI scans would be the study of choice. So for looking at the actual anatomy, CT scan, the, the bony anatomy, CT scans would be better. But looking for um, the cause and the bone marrow signal and other possible diseases, then MRI scans would be better. And by the way, this is, I just wanna take this moment also to talk about um, uh, quality because Gail kind of touched upon it a little bit. And um, I think a lot of people uh, who are not used to seeing a lot of imaging like uh, Dr. Michio um, and Dr. Salam and I um, think that all MRI scans or all CT scans or even all x-rays are the same. Um, it's kind of like a lab test. You go to your lab and you get your blood glucose um, um, uh, checked and then they give you a number and you kind of assume that you know the behind the curtain, it's all the same thing. Um, that may be true of a blood glucose test, although I'm not going to go into that. It's not always true, um, but it's not true of imaging. Um, um, imaging has a lot to do with the hardware, the equipment that the site has. So um, the, uh, how, how current the equipment is, how new it is, um, similar to driving a car, right? You may have you know, the brand new Mercedes, which runs beautifully um, or not, or you may have that 35 year old Honda, which is, which breaks down all the time. It's the same thing for an MRI machine. It's all hardware, it's mechanical, it's computers. So the, the newer, the uh, better maintained, um, the better pictures you're gonna get with an MRI scan and a CT scan. Um, so that's very important. Different MRI machines of different field strength dif give you different quality images. And that actually makes a huge difference to us who are interpreting these images and your um, pain management um, specialists and your spine surgeons to be able to see disease and how well you see it. Um, if the image quality is very poor, if the images are blurry, if it's not sharp enough, you will and you can miss things or, um, or things that um, may be misdiagnosed. If there's something there on a poor quality MRI scan, you may not actually make the correct diagnosis. Um, so just be aware of that. And I'm not going to promote our site or any other site. I think that there's a lot of good places in New York City and around the country that do excellent imaging, but just don't think that, you know, that if your doctor writes you a script, that just going anywhere is the same thing. I can't, I can't agree with this enough. Um, occasionally I'll, I'll have a patient who comes in and they have an MRI, um, but it is of such poor quality that at times I actually need to send them for a repeat MRI. Right. It's and, and, yeah. <clears throat> and, some, yeah. and someone just asked, how do you know? There are a couple of ways of knowing. First of all, typically major academic centers um, like, like ourselves at Cornell, um, NYU, Mount Sinai, Columbia in New York City, um, major academic centers tend to have newer equipment. We tend to work with vendors more. We, get, we update our MRI machines usually every four to six years. We get new MRI machines. They're usually on lease. We don't buy them and keep them. It's basically, we lease a car, you're leasing an MRI machine. So after three, four, five, six years, you get the newest um, software and hardware upgrades. Um, but um, typically bigger is better. You know, the bigger the site, the more radiologists, the more machines, the bigger the operation, they're tend to they're gonna have better quality. Also look for the American College of Radiology seal. Typically that's on websites for, for the place that you're going to get your MRI scan on. The American College of Radiology is basically the quality assurance arm of radiology. They're the ones that actually check the imaging to make sure it's good enough quality. I think something that patients can, um, you know, a really easy question for patients to ask when they're thinking about where they're getting their imaging done is sort of what Tesla magnet, uh, what strength magnet the MRI machine is. And um, there's different strengths, but the most common ones are 1.5 and three Tesla. Um, in certain circumstances, you may need one or the other, and, and that could be prescribed by a radiologist or your provider that's ordering the, the, the scan. But, you know, generally speaking, anything less than a 1.5 Tesla, you need to pause and ask yourself, you know, is this a quality scan or not? And maybe I should consider um, finding something else. Yeah, and, and, and generally speaking, I would actually say one Tesla to three Tesla is diagnostic okay. quality. Anything less than one Tesla 
the images are going to be uh, are going to be compromised. And by the way, you can actually call up the radiology site and ask them, what equipment do you have? How new is your equipment? How, what is your field strength of your magnets? You know, and you can ask questions like, you know, do you have radiation safety protocols? Do you use for CT scans? Do you use uh, dose decreasing algorithms? So where the scanners, the newest scan, the newer scanners give you less radiation and at the same time improve quality using artificial intelligence um, algorithms that are now being applied. That was not available five, 10 years ago. And Dr. Gisors, which of these, you know, uh, uh, CT scan versus MRI, do they both have radiation or, 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 um, uh, or not? No, so, so X-rays and CT scans are gonna have what we call ionizing radiation. Now, um, we get this question a lot in radiology. The amount of radiation is very, is very small. And you can actually go again to the American College of Radiology website, and they actually have relative doses. So it gives you an idea of how much radiation you're getting. Um, they typically compare it to cosmic radiation, how much radiation you get just walking around the planet from, from cosmic rays. So like a CT scan of the spine may be equivalent to two years of cosmic radiation or three years of cosmic radiation. Um, typically we try to reduce that radiation as much as possible and still get good imaging. Um, but the huge advantage of MRI scans over CT scans is that you can um, um, get beautiful images of your soft tissues, your muscles, your bone, your, cord, your spinal cord, et cetera, without having to radiate the patient. It is less um, convenient for the patient because they have to sit in a, what looks like a tighter space for a longer period of time. Um, but even people who are claustrophobic, by the way, um, almost 90% of claustrophobic patients, if you give them a little bit of, of uh, benzodiazepines, meaning some Valium or some Ativan, they can typically have an MRI scan. Um, it's a very small percentage of claustrophobic patients that just won't get into an MRI scan no matter what, in which case a CT scan may be necessary because it's not as enclosed. That brings up a good point too, because um, I definitely have a lot of patients who have uh, claustrophobia. And so are open MRIs as, are they of sufficient quality or, or, or is it, or, or not? Yeah, so, so Vincent, uh, that, that's, a, that's a great question because um, a lot of people go to these open MRI places that offer open MRI thinking that it's, um, you know, especially patients that are claustrophobic, um, thinking that, you know, they'll get a similar quality exam. Typically, open MRI scanners are, um, I wouldn't say typically, I would say always under, under one Tesla. They're on the order of 0.3 Tesla to 0.6 Tesla. So, and think of Tesla kind of like the size of the car's engine. You know, the, the, uh, the higher the number, the more powerful that car is gonna be. Same thing with the MRI machine. The lower the Tesla number, the lower the resolution of your MRI is going to be. So even, so sometimes an open MRI is the right decision in patients who absolutely cannot have a closed MRI scan because of claustrophobia um, or in patients whose body habit is. So if you just happen to be a big person, um, sometimes you cannot um, get into a closed MRI scan. But other than that, if possible, always look for a closed, um, what we call wide bore. Wide bore and open are two different things. Open is, is low, low Tesla field strength. Um, wide bore is a closed MRI scan, but the opening of the MRI scan is relatively larger than the older MRI scans that we used to have you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago. Um, so someone said that upright MRI revealed a disc protrusion that regular one did not in different positions. Um, I'm, 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 I won't um, uh, say that that's untrue because typically uh, closed MRIs can find most disc protrusions. Um, it, it is on occasion, um, rarely, that if by moving the position, the disc will protrude out a little bit more. But honestly, I would have to take a look at that specific MRI to really comment more on that, on that, on that chat question um, because it may just be that the um, person who interpreted the open MRI overinterpreted or incorrectly interpreted as a disc protrusion where it may have not been, but it was difficult to see because of the poor quality of the open MRI scan. Do, do patients get MRIs in positions other than um, 
uh, the traditional supine, for instance, in, yeah, in so, flexion, so, for instance? Well, yeah, typically, typically closed MRI scans, it's, it's usually lying on your back. Um, if you're looking to see dynamic stability, how the spine reacts to different positions, um, what we do prefer to do is x-rays, radiographs. And radiographs give you a lot of information when, because patients can really flex and extend much more, much more significantly um, so that we can see how the spine moves in different positions. Um, now, we do do flexion extension sometimes in closed MRI scans, but not of the lumbar spine, of the cervical spine. So we can perform flexion and extension of the neck in a closed MRI scan. Um, there is some utility to an open MRI with different positions. So I'm not, I'm not gonna say that that's, that that's useless. It's, not, it's, it's definitely useful for certain patients, for certain diseases where you can flex and extend someone in an open MRI scan, but that person is probably still gonna need a closed MRI scan and the open MRI scan with the different positions would be an additional adjunct um, study to do to give you more information if needed. And that's not necessarily, you know, and, and, that's, and that's, I think, kind of what um, the, the uh, Miriam Fisher said there in the chat, that if, um, uh, if you have a closed MRI scan that doesn't show any problem, sometimes an open MRI scan in different positions may show, a, show an issue. Um, so I, I'm sure we have a very uh, lengthy discussion about all of, these, all, all of these topics. In the interest of time, Dr. Salma, how about you guide us a little bit more um, towards some of the interventions that neuroradiologists um, uh, perform? Um, sure. So part of our practice is um, working in an interdisciplinary fashion. So in a, in a team situation with a lot of the rehab doctors and neurosurgeons and neurologists to um, decide if an intervention is warranted based on the patient's presenting symptoms, um, complaints and findings on the imaging. So these are just two examples of um, our imaging suites at our David H. Koch Center, which is our DHK center. And that's where we um, do our interventions. Next slide. So diagnostic radiology actually does a whole host of interventions. Um, we sort of clump them in two categories. The first is diagnostic, sort of, which means we're doing an intervention, not necessarily to help or cure or improve the symptom, but to um, help find a diagnosis. So we do lumbar punctures, also known as spinal taps. There's different types of myelogram imaging. And we also sometimes do nerve blocks, not necessarily in hopes of curing the pain, but deciding is that where a patient's pain is coming from so that they can pre help predict whether or not they would improve with surgery. So um, we've done that um, many times and it, it helps patients feel a little bit more comfortable that the surgery is indicated and it may mimic at least a component of their relief that they may get after surgery. And we also do biopsies. And then um, we also do several interventions, which are all image guided. That's part of the radiology um, that provide therapy or um, pain relief. So we can do blocks, um, we can do ablations, and we also are, our service does a large component of um, CSF leak work, which is when you have um, leaking of the fluid of the spine um, and finding those leaks and patching them through image guided intervention. So this is an example of one of the procedures called a myelogram, um, where we place a needle, a small needle through the back and we inject dye. So this particular patient um, was unable to get an MRI because of a pacer. So instead we can do this and this basically opacifies or, or dyes that all that fluid. And then we can actually see the structures within the fluid because those structures don't take up the dye or the contrast. So um, the picture on the right shows that this patient was having symptoms because of a disc herniation that we just couldn't see on a regular CT, but this patient couldn't get an MRI. So we implement this a lot. So it's considered a procedure, it's an image guided intervention, um, and it helps when a patient can't get an MRI. Next slide. One thing that, that I'll mention here is that uh, as an interventional pain provider, you know, I use x-ray guidance for a lot of my procedures, but, you know, Dr. Salama's team here, um, they have access to CT guidance. So the, this image that you see here is actually a needle guided with a, with a CT scanner. So for certain uh, procedures that, um, uh, you know, for instance, in the upper cervical spine or procedures that, that really do um, 
uh, require extreme precision, uh, sometimes that CT guidance um, is uh, definitely very, very helpful here. Um, so uh, this is an example of, or two patients where we did diagnostic MRI imaging and these patients, their, their problem had nothing, there was no intervention or, or procedure that we could do to help with their problem. The first patient on the left actually had a nutritional abnormality um, and correcting their vitamin deficiency actually can cure them of their um, quote spine symptoms. So it's really important for radiology and your, your referring provider to work together to make sure the appropriate treatments are being provided um, for the problem that you have. And then the example on the right is a patient who's having an autoimmune disease um, of their lumbar spine. And again, there's no injection or um, surgery that's going to work for this patient to cure them of the condition that they're um, complaining of. And, and this has to be treated with immunosuppression. And that's in contrast to some of the other abnormalities that we find on imaging. Next slide where we do ultimately end up with interventions that can help with patients. Um, so the imaging on the left is showing a CT guided biopsy. Um, this patient was having pain and it turned out to be related to a cancer diagnosis and that patient didn't know that. So we're there to help with the referrers when they come up with some, um, something that needs a CT guidance and um, in, in critical regions. So this was a biopsy that we can perform. And then on the right, this sort of touches upon what Dr. Michio said, this is a CT guided cervical nerve block. So as the nerve blocks go higher up there, you're working in a smaller space with more critical structures. And when you do them, when you do these nerve blocks by X-ray, you're basically using your bony anatomy to determine where the needle is. And you can't exactly see all the structures that the needle is going by as you're doing those procedures, you know about where you are based on the bony anatomy. And in the lower spine, that, that's fine, that's sufficient because in that region, you know, you don't have all of the arteries to the head and, and to the neck. But in the cervical spine, although these can be done under x-ray, we, we take it a next step and, and we use our um, expertise in CT guidance to um, safely advance our needles into the appropriate places. And, and we're able to do nerve blocks um, in this way and in a safer manner. Next slide. I do. Um, and then also we're, we're here to help with other type of interventions. So this patient had a cyst within their spine from their degenerative changes or their arthritis. And um, these can be treated surgically via open surgery. Um, but obviously, if there's ways to treat them through a minimally invasive approach, um, you know, that's much less morbidity, hospital time, operating time for the patients. So we're able to treat these via a needle through the skin. There's no incision. And um, this is an example of we ruptured the cyst intentionally because the cyst is pushing on a nerve. And when we rupture it, sort of that pressure on the nerve is released. Um, and this patient avoids an open surgery to resect that or take, or take out that cyst. And we do that through needles. Um, so that's another example of how we use our CT guidance um, to treat some of the findings that we may find during our diagnostic and imaging workup. Very good. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Salama and, and Dr. Chisoris here for your, your presentations. Um, I, I think we'll sort of you know, open it up uh, to some questions here. We're going to uh, look through the chat box, see if people have any any questions. Um, you know, they were uh, there was a recent question here about side effects to nerve blocks, and um, and as Dr. Desaurus has responded here, um, you know, any uh, interventional procedure that's done with a needle definitely can have uh, side effects or adverse effects. Uh, as he mentions here, there can be. Uh, bleeding, infection, and you know a lot of these um, injections are done around your nerves, um, and so therefore there is always the risk of of nerve injury. Um, but this is why we have all this uh, this equipment. Um, the equipment is there to guide us to uh, make this these um, injections as safe as possible. Um, and and I want to say that you know kind of like selecting the right um, the right team to do your MRI, you want to select the right team to care for your back and care for your neck, and you want a team that's conservative. You know I say to my patients all the time, if you if you have pain that is mild to moderate, 
you probably don't need an injection because it's probably not worth the risk. However, you know, if you, if you have severe pain that's limiting your ability to do what you love, a limiting your ability to spend time with your family or to work, then it's time to do something about it. Um, and you want to do it in a safe manner. And that's, um, and that's what uh, our team is about. And um, neuroradiology is a big part of that. You know, um, one of the things we didn't have uh, uh, time to, to, to really talk about in detail tonight is that um, uh, we talk as a group quite often. In fact, uh, we have a weekly spine conference that actually Dr. Salama heads, heads that conference. And we go through complicated cases together. Um, and, you know, everybody brings their skill set to the table. So the surgeons are there. Uh, the, the interventional pain physicians are there, neurology is there. Um, and uh, through kind of listening to all these different unique perspectives on the patient's um, situation, um, we can uh, find the optimal treatment for the patient. Um, so, uh, and, and definitely neuroradiology plays a really optimal, a really, really pivotal role in that, certainly. And, and uh, on, a, on a similar note, we, we enjoy working with the providers who see the patient on a regular basis. It helps us interpret the imaging better. Um, it teaches us ex exactly what the concern is. And working closely with the provider improves the, the interpretation often of the MRI scan. So I, I want to emphasize, and I agree, that being at a place that really works as a team and has constant communication and easy communication and where providers enjoy working with each other for the benefit of the patient is extremely important. And um, I agree that that's something that we have and, and the spine conference is extremely useful. Yeah, and I just want to, uh, first of all, I have to run, but I wanted to thank Dr. Michio for inviting myself and Dr. Salama. But one thing that Dr. Michio said that I think is very important is conservative. I think being conservative when it comes to back pain is very important. Um, it's uh, a lot of people want to jump in and do procedures and do interventions and do surgeries. I think that um, there is definitely a place for all of that, as long as it's appropriately diagnosed and appropriately managed and conservative management fails. Um, last, thing, last thing you want is to get unnecessary procedures or spine surgery for back pain. I think that is a wonderful note to end upon. And I want to thank you all for joining us today. Uh, this episode of Spine Time, like all the episodes, uh, will be available on YouTube um, on the Weill Cornell Medicine uh, Brain and Spine Center channel. So check that out. And um, of course, um, if you would like to have a consultation with um, one of the physicians here, um, uh, feel free to contact our center. Um, uh, the number is on our website uh, and you can request an appointment online. Um, and so uh, we'll see you again at the next Spine Time. Thank you so much for attending. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Michio.